Arizona Science is supported by Research Corporation for Science Advancement. For EZPM, I'm Tim Swindle, Professor Emeritus of Planetary Science at the University of Arizona, and this is Arizona Science. Joining me today is Chris Walker, a professor in the university's Department of Astronomy and the principal investigator of the recently completed GUSTO mission. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Tim. Chris, what were you trying to accomplish with GUSTO? Yeah, so what GUSTO is, is a balloon-borne observatory. It has like a one-meter diameter mirror-type telescope on it, and it flies at about 126,000 feet around Antarctica. And what it was designed to do is understand our cosmic origins, at least part of the story, in particular study the interstellar medium. Why did you use a balloon rather than a telescope on the ground or in space? What we're trying to do with Gusto is we map the Milky Way. You know, when you look up the night sky, you see the band of stars across the sky. And the Milky Way is our galaxy, and our galaxy is shaped like a Frisbee with a tennis ball stuck in it. We live halfway out in the disk of the Frisbee. So when you flip that Frisbee on edge, you see a band, and that's when we look up the night sky, that's what we see. So what we were doing with Gusto was mapping the galaxy in, in uh, two important lines, carbon and nitrogen, which are important for the origin evolution of life, to understand its distribution throughout the galaxy and how it can be incorporated into stars. When you say lines, you're talking about spectral lines. What frequencies or wavelengths are these at? The, we did two primary ones with ionized nitrogen at 1.4 terahertz and uh, ionized carbon at 1.9 terahertz. And to put it in context, that's between 15,000 and 50,000 times the frequency of the radio you're listening to right now. And how does that compare to the frequency or wavelength of visible light? Oh, it's much lower frequency, longer wavelength than visible light. And what happens is, is that the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere likes to absorb those wavelengths of light. And that's why we need to get above as much of the atmosphere as possible. And that's why our observatory is a balloon-borne observatory. Why not go into space to do that? It would be great to go into space, but the cost of space can be prohibitive. And so if you can do something on a high-altitude stratospheric balloon, then you should do it because it's, the costs are you know, 100 to 1,000 times less than a comparable orbital mission. So you launched from Antarctica. How long were you up? We flew for 57 and a half days, uh, which broke the record for NASA, which previously I think was 55 days, was the longest a duration balloon-borne science mission for NASA. How are you able to stay up that long without wandering someplace you shouldn't be? Around Antarctica during the winter here, summer there, the wind pattern sets up in, in a counterclockwise or anti-cyclonic configuration. And so if you launch your payload up to stratospheric altitudes, it gets caught in that kind of jet stream that's spinning around uh, the South Pole. And it just sort of lazily goes around Antarctica about 15 to 20 knots. And, uh, and it mostly stays over the continent. And uh, ultimately, you could potentially recover your payload once it comes back down. Gusto is a NASA Explorer mission. And so, you know, you don't usually recover your, your spacecraft, your observatories, and bring it back down to Earth. So we wrote the proposal such that recovery was optional. It would be great if we could get it, but it wasn't required. So we were able to get all our data down via Starlink is what we use primarily, uh, to relay the data back to Earth. But it did turn out that the payload did come down on the other side of Antarctica, and we should be able to recover most of it. What is it exactly that you're trying to look for in looking for carbon and nitrogen? The carbon line that we look at at 1.9 terahertz, the wavelength of it would be 158 microns, is the brightest spectral line in the whole far infrared part of the spectrum. And you can use it to uh, probe all phases of the interstellar medium from when it's a hot, diffuse gas to when it forms molecular clouds and stars and, and back again. So we're using both carbon and nitrogen to probe the life cycle of the interstellar medium to understand how 4.7 billion years ago we evolved from a, a diffuse gas cloud out in space to a solar system like our own. You think of the interstellar medium as like, oh, this is some ivory tower thing. It really has no relevance to my existence. But every atom and molecule in your body 4.7 billion years ago was part of the interstellar medium. And we're trying to understand the story of how you go from that one light year cloud of gas and dust to what we are today. Well, good luck with all of it. Thank you. 
Our guest today has been Chris Walker, who has been leading a balloon-borne mission to map the Milky Way. This is Tim Swindle, and you have been listening to Arizona Science. You can also listen to this and other Arizona Science segments by going to the AZPM website at azpm.org. Thank you to Research Corporation for Science Advancement for their support of Arizona Science.